if everyone can get seated, we're going to get started. Please take your seats. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Thank you for being here. I'm Margaret Mueller. I'm the new president and CEO of the Executives Club of Chicago. If I don't look familiar to some of you, don't be surprised. Today starts week six for me. Um, and I'm really thrilled to be here and seeing all the exciting changes that are happening here at the Executives Club. And if there's one thing that I've learned in my first few weeks here in this role is that this community is one of the most welcoming and committed and engaged groups in the city. And I'm really looking forward to working with all of you. So thank you for being here tonight. And I'm equally thrilled to be hosting our second Chicago Tech and Innovation Outlook without a polar vortex swirling outside. <laughs> so thank you, um, all of you, for bearing with us through the rescheduling and everything. And for those of you who still showed up that night, like, bravo, and I'm very sorry, but <clears throat> so brave. Um, so we promise to get you out of here in time so you can all start watch the election results roll in. We'll see if Howard gives any predictions on the election. Um, so before we get started, though, I'd like to take a moment to recognize our members who are in the audience tonight. We're so grateful for your ongoing support and ideas and suggestions. So if our members could just please stand for a brief moment so we can just um, thank you and recognize you for your contributions. <laughs> People are popping up. So now I'd like to recognize and thank our generous sponsors. Our platinum sponsor, BMO Harris Bank. Our gold sponsors, Discover and Energy BBDO. Our silver sponsors, Baker McKenzie, Catalyst Technologies, and Mesereau Financial. And finally, our media sponsor, The Wall Street Journal. We can't do any of this without you, and we are so grateful for your support of this programming and for providing cutting edge content and experiences for our audiences. And this music is very interesting. <laughs> Um, so last but certainly not least, I want to welcome and thank our speakers who will be introduced here in just a moment. It seems that every conversation under any theme in any industry these days revolves around technology's role and how leaders are innovating and disrupting the status quo. And that's why this discussion is so important and timely and why we're honored to hear from these leaders in Chicago's tech community. So thank you, Howard, Tracy, Betsy, Amanda, and Kevin for being here tonight with us. And then just quickly on a logistics note, I encourage you to join the conversation by texting your questions to the panelists at any time during the program. So by texting exec to 22333. So again, that's E-X-E-C to 22333. And we'll be um, filtering those through to the panelists. So at this time, I'd like to bring up Kyle Barnett, who's the Chief Operating Officer of US Personal and Business Banking at BMO Financial Group, and he's going to be introducing our speakers. Thank you. Hey, good evening, everyone. Really excited to uh, have you all here tonight and really looking forward to the program. So our program begins with a presentation by Howard Tolman, Executive Director of the Ed Kaplan Family Institute of Innovation and Tech Entrepreneurship at Illinois Institute of Technology. Howard's the former CEO of 1871, where digital startups get their start and the general managing partner of G to T3V and Chicago's high tech investment partners, which are Chicago based early stage ventures. He's a mayor, uh, he's a member of Mayor Emanuel's Chicago Next and the Cultural Affairs Council, the Innovate Illinois Advisory and Art Council, and an adjunct professor at Kellogg. So we're really looking forward to, uh, to hearing what he has to say this evening. So uh, the next thing we're gonna do quickly is just introduce the panelists. So they've got very uh, great resumes and I'm gonna get a few high points on some of their backgrounds. Amanda Lannert is the CEO of Jellyvision, the maker of interactive benefit communication software, Alex. More than 1,500 companies use Alex to help their employees understand complex topics from choosing healthcare insurance plans to saving for retirement and navigating a leave of absence. Since taking over Jellyvision, at, since taking over in 2011, Amanda's played a key role in the company's success. She spearheaded Jellyvision's pivot from a service agency to a profitable software as a service company and has grown the employee count from 100 to 400 employees in just five years. In the last three years, Jellyvision's customer count has increased by over 250%. 
The next panelist is Kevin Willer, and he's the partner of Chicago Ventures, a seeds stage venture capital fund, where he's overseeing all aspects of Chicago Ventures, including fund management, deal sourcing and investments, and working directly with portfolio companies. He joined the fund in 2013, and previously was the founding CEO of 1871 and the co-founder of the Google Chicago office in 2000. The next panelist is Betsy Ziegler, who's the first female CEO of 1871, now the number one ranked university-affiliated tech incubator in the world. Previously to 1871, Betsy was the chief innovation officer at the Kellogg School of Management, Northwestern University, and was responsible for portfolio innovation, as well as integrating technology with the Kellogg educational experience. From 2011 through 2015, she served as the Associate Dean of the Degree Program and the Dean of Students. And finally, our moderator, Tracy Seward, has served as the Business Strategy and Technology Institute for over 25 years. She is Accenture's Global Consulting and Innovation Knowledge Director, focused on go-to-market offerings and differentiation strategy. She also serves as Accenture's Global Chief Knowledge Officer and co-leads the Chicago Accenture Strategy community. I'm thrilled to have these panelists and experts here. I think we're going to have a great session. I'm very excited about the Chicago tech space, including our partnership uh, between BMO and 1871. Uh, we've run two mentor programs uh, in 2017 and 2018, and we're actually launching another program in 2019 as we continue to support the startup uh, and innovators community here in Chicago. So thank you guys for joining us. We're gonna have a great evening. And if you would join me in a round of applause, we will get this started. So uh, Howard, welcome aboard. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. It appears people from 1871 will go anywhere at any time. We're happy to be uh, serve on any panels, whatever you need. And we do catering as well. Um, so I, I want to start with two important rules, which I think are really critical. Uh, and there's a joke here, in case it's not clear. Uh, actually, what I want to say to begin with is that uh, speed is sort of the name of the game today. And one of the things that's so absolutely astonishing is that we don't think that in the history of human sort of existence, the present has been as temporary as it is today. Uh, viral minutes you know, actually seem to click by even more quickly than the real world. And to give you just a simple business example, it used to be not so many years ago that the average holding period of a security was eight years, and these days it's about four months. And so everything is changing, including sort of our ability to understand the implications of technology. We tend to overestimate the short-term impact. It's gonna be world-changing in no time at all, and underestimating how it's really gonna change every part of our lives. Now, we think you can do that for a year. We think you can do it sort of for two years. By the time you get to about three years, we think you're, uh, you're guessing under the best of circumstances. And frankly, I think that long-range planning, five to 10 years, is basically only to make astrology seem like a credible science, okay? And so today, the truth is that it's size that is a limitation in many respects. It limits the agility, your ability to react. If you're not in a hurry, if you don't understand that it's a race, then you're gonna have serious problems, and we call this sort of the autocatalytic nature of change. And what that means is that every single change that comes down the pipeline accelerates the next change. And it's not enough in your business to say we're pretty fast, we're pretty responsive, because that's a measure of velocity. And what we're concerned with today is acceleration. How fast is your business getting faster? How much are you sort of getting ahead of people? Because if you look out into the world and the world is changing more rapidly than you are, then you're going to be slipping in the wrong direction. And today, the rate of change in our lives is the slowest, think about this for a minute, the slowest it's going to be for the rest of our lives. And that's just the beginning. So today, you either change or you die. And people don't change because they get hit on the head with an apple or lightning strikes them. They change because they feel the heat. And it turns out the change isn't hard. What's hard is overcoming the resistance to change to what has worked pretty well for us in the past. And the message is, 
it's not going to work going forward. It's just not a good strategy. And what gets in the way most of innovation and change? It turns out it's success. It turns out that the stuff that worked is the stuff that we're reluctant to part with. And, and yet, we need to keep moving on or else we won't be successful in the future. So being a little uneasy, being a little uncomfortable makes sense. If you want to check this out, look at your BlackBerry, which I highly recommend. Uh, or you, know, you can pick up some stuff at Sears, also a very interesting thing. But, but look, the, the truth is, when we look at the companies that were the name of the game not so many years ago, and we look today at who's there, the only thing that's a little strange is what is Microsoft doing there? And it turns out that it's not quite clear. It's not so obvious. I mean, Microsoft missed the phone. They missed the web. Unless you binged anything, we think they sort of missed search. And so what kept them in the game? Well, first of all, we're lazy. So the installed base continues to be amazing. Second of all, the composition of their revenue stream is comparable to Amazon. But the rest of these guys that are out there are pretty much one horse ponies. And that's not going to be a sustainable long term strategy. So Microsoft is basically these days more valuable than Apple for I think three main reasons. First, they made a really smart bet on the cloud and you know they carved into Amazon owning, just completely and totally owning um, you know that marketplace. Second, when they made a mistake on the phone, they bagged it and they said, all right, I got to get on with the rest of my life. And third, they're buying their way into opportunities, whether it's LinkedIn or GitHub. And so these models continue to change and that's going forward. And one of the questions they ask is not simply, how can I do things better in my business uh, today than I couldn't do yesterday? It's what can I do that I never imagined that I could do before? And the single most striking thing about the way we think about investment, capital, and business today is this idea of understanding usership as opposed to ownership. And this is astonishing. This is completely and totally astonishing that access in our lives today is much more important than assets. It's not about owning things, it's about the experience, it's about utility. And so whether it's cars that we can now rent you know, across all the different manufacturers. You know, you can literally have GM say you can have a car anytime you want it, one day at a time, one hour at a time, no gas charges, no insurance charges. So when I was just in Detroit, what was so interesting was they don't even talk about cars. They don't call themselves car companies anymore. They're mobility businesses, okay? Because the truth is that's where we're headed. You know, the car is probably going to be a unit of transportation, but it's not going to be the same thing that it meant to us in the past. So we don't know of a business that isn't subject to this problem and this kind of radical change that's going on, whether it's Wells Fargo getting rid of, you know, hundreds and hundreds of branches, whether it's J.P. Morgan Chase, you know, accelerating their digital strategies, or Robinhood with six million brokerage accounts. You know, these are pretty astonishing things. And yet, you would think that the banking industry was a pretty regulated industry, that it was pretty much protected by barriers and regulations. And yet, one of the biggest banks today in the country is Starbucks. Starbucks, because of the deposits on those cards that you use to buy coffee. One of the most amazing things that the Amazon Prime people have just announced is that half of their customers would just as soon bank with Amazon. So if you think the banking business isn't under a little bit of pressure, you can, uh, you can guess again. So in terms of what's going on, a lot of what has worked for us in the past, as I said, isn't going to work going forward. And it's not going to be a little bit of a ride that's just slightly bumpy. It's going to be difficult because you can't evolve yourself into the kind of radical change that it's going to take to be competitive going forward. So whether it's the Amazon Go stores, which have no cashiers, or more cashiers in this country, by the way, than teachers, whether it's JP Morgan rolling out smart contracts, which are pretty amazing and eliminate hundreds of thousands of hours of lawyers looking at the same documents and pretending that they're adding value. Uh, facial recognition, completely amazing. The machines are far better than we are. And if you think it's easy to tell the difference between the mutt and the muffin, it's not. And my, my wife insisted on a gluten-free example of this as well. 
So I've added to the talk a gluten-free example, but it's the same issue. Um, here's the truth. If your job basically is a set of instructions, if I'm rewarding you for doing the same thing over and over again, albeit flawlessly, that's going away. So whether it's AI that can read uh, x-rays better, whether it's robots that are exploding in warehouses, whether it's bread making machines, and the buckets are pretty straightforward. The buckets are, if I'm managing other people, if I have expertise, I'm okay today. If I'm dealing with customers in unpredictable situations, I've got a little room. But if I'm doing redundant and repetitive work, it's over. It's gonna be automated, it's gonna go away. And what's so threatening and so sort of challenging is what is redundant work continues to sort of grow. So the machines aren't sitting still. The machines can do eye tests. The machines can check for auditory uh, deficiencies. We can do all kinds of investment advising. In fact, $7 trillion will be under management by about 2025. We've got funds that are being run now by artificial intelligence. So when we say, what's going on? Where is this stuff coming from? You know, I, I like to say that when I talk to a specific company or industry, I'm not going to try and explain what's going on in your business because I don't know about your business. What we know is where is the disruption coming from, and it's at the edges. And so we built this chart. It's a very simple chart, but at 1871, there's probably four or 500 companies, and all day long, they look at businesses, and they say, against one of these vectors of competition, action, activity, product, service, access, how can I eat their lunch? And that's the first analysis. And frankly, each company needs to do this themselves. Each company needs to understand what's going on and be honest about what the deficiencies are. Call your office, call your, check your website out, see how your customer service people respond. And then you have to do another thing which is you can't be successfully all things to all people anyway. So you have to say, what is gonna differentiate what I do and make it special and rewardable from what everybody else does? And you need to double down on that and forget the stuff that can be readily commoditized, and then you have to do it before someone else does it to you. One of the great stories of sort of these radical transformations are these guys. Uh, I call them mail flicks because they mailed out about a trillion of these stupid red envelopes, but you would know them as Netflix. There came a day about two years into their existence when 99% of their revenues were in DVD sales and only 1% was in rental, 1%. But they heard the footsteps of Amazon and they said, you know what? We don't wanna be in that path. <clears throat> and so they bagged the entire sale business and convert it into the streaming business. And today, they're bigger cumulatively than just about any other player in the space. And if you wanna understand how radical this change is going to be, let me tell you that in 2019, Netflix alone will produce as many films as all of the Hollywood studios combined. And that is part one of an enormous sea change in terms of what's going on. The bigger thing, is that the game has changed in a very significant other way. And that is that it used to be that the Hollywood guys could catch up because they had an unlimited source of money. Today, they can't afford to buy their way back into the game. And so they can't buy Amazon. They can't really buy Netflix. And you know, I think that you can make the same argument about the car guys. They wish they could buy Tesla. They wish they could buy Rivian and some of these other things. I don't think it's gonna happen. So what's driving the changes? Number one is time. We have hundreds of companies that are dealing with every aspect of what we call the economy of now. Number two is to understand what's going on with messaging. It's blowing away social media. It's blowing away email for sure. Why do messages work so well? Well, think about it in your own lives. A couple of simple things. It's right there. It's there all the time. It completely interrupts. And this idea that it's always there and it's always on and it's impossible to ignore has developed a channel that we're sort of like the dogs, you know, chasing the squirrels. I mean, we can't do anything but respond to it. So we're seeing whole new businesses growing up 
that are going to be built around the one or two seconds that it takes to respond to a text and to offer you commerce opportunities, marketing opportunities, other kinds of choices. But the biggest change is voice. The biggest change in our next three or four years is going to be the way that voice changes everything we do and how we interact with what's going on in the world. Voice four times faster than text, but a hundred times more difficult. So Alexa is in just about everyone's home. The other guys are trying to get in there. The smartest guys have already given up the ghost. If you haven't seen the ads for the Facebook portal, you'll notice an interesting little thing. And the little thing is it says, oh, by the way, Alexa is built in. So Facebook decided we're not going to go to war with Amazon. And here's what's so interesting. To date, we're not even using our in-house speakers and the whole experience for shopping. And that's just beginning. But Alexa will be in almost 130 million households in no time at all. And when you have Alexa, and many, many homes have two and three devices, the purchase, the penetration, the results for Amazon is extraordinarily up. Now, if that wasn't bad enough, or if that didn't lean toward Amazon in very interesting ways, half of the searches that we do by 2020 are going to be by voice. And so what does this mean? Well, this is huge in our lives, and it's huge for brands, it's huge for businesses. It's going to change the game in many ways because we don't want 10 million results, okay? We want one answer. We don't want a lot of choices. We don't want lists. And so when we look at what has worked in the past, I, I built this sort of pyramid. So voice is going to change the way that search works in a very interesting way. When we were in front of a desktop, 10 responses was sort of top of the fold, as we used to say in the newspaper business. That was acceptable. On the phone, maybe five would get you there. But when the response is voice, it's one. It's one. We want an answer. And so lists aren't going to work. And even more importantly, there's a now a piece of real estate that's unbelievable called position zero, which means what is going to be read back to me when I ask this question on my phone? And to tell you how this is going to bear on brands and how threatening it is in some respects, They've already given up online the value of packaging to a very large extent, the value of sort of tactile interaction. With voice, it becomes much more a case of fewer and fewer words, simplification, and the number of Alexa inquiries without a brand is growing. And so guess who loves that? Of course, Amazon loves that. Try to ask Alexa for Duracell batteries. You have to ask about 78 times before she stops saying, why don't you just buy the Amazon ba Basics batteries? They're cheaper, they're better. So here's this thing that's going on, this huge shift. We're moving from what we used to think of as the conventional web to the conversational web. And it's a huge shift because we're not going to be using these devices to talk to somebody else. It's not a portal anymore. It's literally we're going to be talking to the machines. And so I think each of you should say, what should I tell my kids? Should I tell them to say thank you to Alexa or not? Because it's as much of a polite conversation as anything else. And if we don't let them, you know, I mean, how are they going to know to say thank you to the librarian if they're not saying thank you to Alexa? So think about the kinds of things that are coming. This is an emotional coach. This is a diagnostic program for uh, COPD. These are all kinds of telemedicine solutions and other kinds of solutions. And everything is now. Everything is right now. This uh, is a product that we built a while ago. You can uh, buy swag at a game, and then you can have it at home by the time you get home from the game. This is the Philadelphia 76ers. If you look at it through your phone, up pops a buy button, and basically we'll ship it to you um, by the time you get home from the game. Now. The message is simple. The message is you've got to be there and meet my needs wherever I am and whenever I am. And so these are all kinds of different things. I think that we're very close because of some new technologies to the movie theaters not telling us 
to turn off our cell phones anymore. Why? Because of run pee. Now what does it do? Well, it tells us when a good time to go pee is during the movie. Now this is, this is very important, okay? Because if you're just gonna miss sort of a mushy love scene and you know, it doesn't really interfere with anything, let's go, let's get back in a hurry. So bottom line, customer centric, if you're not focused, if you're not basically understanding that the expectations of customers are progressive, that what was fabulous yesterday is just so what today, and oh, by the way, we don't want to wait for anything. So we thought that the web was going to turn us into couch potatoes, and it's very interesting because that hasn't happened. We go get a lot of stuff, click and collect continues to explode. Uh, whether it's curbside, whether it's going into stores and seeing more and more instances of lockers. Uh, now, it doesn't work for everybody. Uh, McDonald's has tried to do it, and it really hasn't worked uh, because it's added a cost for their franchisees. But just when you think that you're on top of this, then Amazon comes along and changes the game again. So this is the dash button. It's one of my favorite buttons. It costs a dollar. And you put it on your washing machine, and when you press it, Amazon gives you your dollar back, and they also ship you a new container of Tide. And it appears there in about an hour and a half. And so, do you think you know what you paid for it? Not a chance, okay? Do you think you cared? Not a bit. Are you gonna clip a coupon and maybe next week go to the store and save 15 cents on Downey? Not in your life, okay? So, 200 brands have already adopted these buttons in almost every case, it's absolutely clear where the button should go. In some cases, it's more confusing. It's a little more confusing, but the idea is the same, okay? So what's really going on is that choice is not as important. Price is not as important. We're lazy. We want it our way. We want it right now. We want to customize it. And so we're seeing that what we're going to have to do is an amazing thing that wasn't possible a while ago, but today is actually possible because of data and because of the implications of data. We can do mass customization, and that's really remarkable. So we can say that we don't have to make bad choices between scale and precision. We can have it all. So when three of you go to Amazon's website to shop, guess what? All three of you will see a different front page times 350 million front pages. And that's the game that they play. And that's just the beginning of how they're going to get ahead of the consumers using data. And so again, to just give you 30 seconds of history, you know, we started with the computer coming along and in the first instant, it helped us to manipulate data. That was really important. The second big change in our lives was connection. So call that the web. So, make data more manageable, connect us to more and more people. Number three was location. So that was the phone, that was mobility. And so these are the drivers. And then the last thing, and you can guess what it is, that's sort of a pun, it's prediction, okay? It's the ability to get ahead of consumers. But more importantly, it's to understand that the flow of information, and what's amazing is in Chicago we have several companies uh, that are doing this already, that are building these uh, basically tools to get us back on top of the flow of data. Because if we don't get on top of the flow of the data, it doesn't, it doesn't matter if we don't understand it and we can't use it. So we're seeing the development of automated dashboards and ingestion machines. And I call this augmented as opposed to artificial intelligence because it makes us smarter, it doesn't really replace us. But you know, you talk to a doctor about this, <clears throat> and it's not clear that they understand it until you say, well, here's the truth. This computer has one million instances of skin cancer. In your life, you'll see maybe two dozen. Who do you think is gonna be a better diagnostician in terms of the kind of the cancer and what's going on? And so we're seeing a lot of this, whether it's improving customer service, uh, whether you know, it's getting ahead of everything that's going on. And you know, I just call this uh, the desire to avoid you know, the problems rather than get a really great deal on the tow truck. So to, to talk about this specifically, you, know, you may have seen the Nivea ad, you certainly have heard about the Pepsi ad where she offered the policeman a 
can of Pepsi or, you know, the Ram trucks were run on Martin Luther King Day or Heineken, you know, did some crazy stuff. And all of this is continuing. You know, everybody in the world is having to apologize for something, Gillette, Gucci. Um, so the truth is <clears throat> that that's not going to stand up much longer. And so we're seeing new businesses that are predictive businesses that literally are able to take the cues from ads, from videos, and tell you how people are going to react to it and what's going to work and what's not going to work. And for example, just to give you a simple example, it turns out we all love puppies. So you can see the, the joy pops up as soon as you see that little dog there. But here's the truth. Here's the, another one of these remarkable changes that every agency, every marketing organization is going to have to deal with. And that is that it's a three-step process. You spend millions making an ad. You spend tens of millions making a marketing campaign. Then when it flops, you get killed on social media, and then you have to do triage and rehabilitation and everything else, and it's unbelievably expensive. So the goal is to get ahead of everything. The goal is to deal with and preempt these kinds of problems using these new tools. I frankly think in two years it's going to be malpractice for an ad agency to say, well, we just held our finger up and we decided this was a cool ad, um, as opposed to saying we tested it using this new kind of technology. Now, a couple of other things that are going on. We don't care about normal distributions. Okay? We don't care, basically, about traffic. Increasingly, the name of the game today is audience. Connected, engaged audience. And a few is far better. And who knows this best? Today, the New York Times is one of the people that knows this best. Newspapers may be dying. The Times Digital is exploding. The market clearly understands it and rewards it. And there's really two things going on. Actually, last quarter, the revenues from digital advertising for the first time in the history of the New York Times exceeded the revenues from print ads. Why? Because one smart reader is worth a thousand boneheads and people who, you know, clicked on, you know, whatever clickbait is out there today. So this approach, though, is really important for every business because we have to start thinking about how do I use these tools so I can do an amazing thing. I can extract additional margin from people who are indifferent to price and don't really care, and then I can use that to actually subsidize and expand the reach of my lower priced offering. So I build the overall pie and I skim the cream off of the top. Pretty amazing. Uh, Target just got caught in sort of a bad way doing this. I don't know if you saw this. So they discovered that when you pull into a Target parking lot, it's geofenced, and they changed the pricing back from the super competitive web pricing to the in-store pricing. So pretty amazing. Uh, and you know, that's just another one of these instances of saying, well, I got you and you're here. And honestly, are you not gonna you know, buy this thing for an extra dollar? So it's all about sort of margin enhancement and managing and using data to manage the experience in different ways. Uh, another part of this that's really critical is customer loyalty. And we have a pretty depressing definition of that which is basically, I haven't seen something better yet. And that's about how it is. Now, that's not to say that well-run loyalty programs don't work, and they work pretty well. If you look at restoration hardware, 95% of the revenue flows through their card programs. But what's important to understand is that nobody today owns the customer for more than a moment because there's constant choice, there's constant competition, we don't have barriers, we don't have switching costs in the same ways that we used to. What we have is attention deficit. And so we make time for what we're interested in, but to understand this attention economy, it's really astonishing because we're competing, not just against competitive product offerings, but against everything that gets in the way of the messages that we wanna to get to you, to engage you, to change your behavior, to pull you into something. And so again, if you look back, when the world started, we were creating products, and then we had a couple of decades where we created financial institutions and instruments, but today it's all about audiences. I mean, the most valuable companies deliver mind share. 
And honestly, today, if you're engaged in social activity and you're not getting paid, you're the product. They're selling slices of your attention, slices of your brain. So companies have to think about this as a manageable asset. This is not something that you can sort of leave to chance. Because you know what we measure and focus on is what differentiates us and makes us competitive and much more powerful in the market. And what you pay attention to is basically what's going to uh, be valuable and define who you are as an organization. So we say you got to pay attention, but not with money. Turns out, not with money. You have to construct something for me that's a valuable transaction. You have to show me that you're going to save me time or money or make me more productive or help me make better decisions or improve my status. And if you do that, then I'm there. But if you don't, if you can't demonstrate, and by the way, this is the same test we use when we're evaluating startups and things like that. Show me the unique proposition, the real deliverable that's going to connect you to customers, because if you don't have customers, you really don't have anything. And so that's uh, that's the way we see the world. Now, going forward, we think that there's basically three things that you need to focus on in terms of the future. One is basically consistency, persistence, and resistance. And what that means is this. Businesses need to design a set of tools, strategies, teams, uh, and focuses that drive these three basic propositions. So consistency means that I know 100% what you stand for. One message, no confusion, there aren't 16 different people talking, there aren't a bunch of competing considerations. You're gonna do something really important for me and you're gonna deliver and it's gonna be easy and it's gonna meet all of my needs. So consistency across everything you do, and by the way, Companies today spend 80% of their money on marketing materials and 20% tracking the results. They need to do just the opposite. They need to spend 70 or 80% making sure that they're reaching the right audiences. And then the materials are almost a secondary consideration, especially in the increasingly digital world. And once voice is here, the materials won't matter at all. So number one is consistency. Number two is persistence. So we're not good readers. You know, we go a million places now. We don't spend any significant time anywhere. Completely depressing. Um, but you have to figure out how to be in my face, how to deliver to me at the right time and place without being sort of creepy, um, all of the things that I need, and when I need it and where I need it and without asking and on a growing and continuing basis. You want me to be reliant because the third goal is to be resistant to abandonment, to have people not leave, not uh, sort of bail on you. And so, again, this is a very interesting thing. It's not because I'm holding you captive. It's because you want to be there because I've demonstrated a real interest in you, a real connection to you, and real value for you. And then I can sell you a lot of things. And we know for a fact that your existing customer base is the lowest hanging fruit, the best prospects, the lowest marketing cost, the people that you want to go deeper with. And then you can build on Conquest Marketing. But Conquest Marketing is about six times more expensive than improving the share of wallet on your individual customers. So. That's the goal. That's sort of the situation. We think that these are drivers. The nice thing about this is none of this is, you know, like radically different. It's just that we haven't taken the time to say, how do I apply these ideas about access and speed and convenience and choice to my business and how do I get rid of, and if there's a buzzword, it's friction free. It's how do I get rid of everything that interrupts the experience that consumers can have with my business or my service. And oh, by the way, the metric is not that you do it no worse than the other three people in your industry, because that's not how we keep score anymore. The way we keep score is what's the last best experience that we had? And then we move that 
to everything else in our life and say, you know what, if Amazon can do this in one day, why do I wait a month for a doctor's appointment? If I can go to CVS or Walgreens on my, on my basically schedule and for free get a flu shot, why would I wait a month, spend $300 for my internist? These are going away. They're just absolutely going away because we see that there's no reason that we shouldn't be in a much better and more powerful position as consumers and as customers than we have been traditionally. You know, the systems have to meet and fit the customer's requirements. You know, we can't say to the customers, learn how to do it our way. It just doesn't work anymore. So, thank you very much. So, shall I bring up the panel now? Is that the deal? All right, Kev, you want to lead the panel up? I got the end. Are you keeping this giant thing on? No. That's always a hard act to follow, right? Is it working? <laughs> so it's also fun to be up here with you guys. I know we've worked together for the last year on, on a project that may come up here today as we as we chat. Um, and I, so I think what I'm going to do here, and I don't know if we've got any questions coming, but definitely we've got some questions that we've already laid out for you guys here. Um, but I want to make sure that it's uh, an interactive conversation and you guys are asking questions as well. So text exec 22333. Anything's on the table, right? Yeah. Very good. All right. Everything. So yes. that's exciting. Do you have a Tide button by chance? I don't. No, I should. <laughs> I absolutely should. I learned it's, something every time I hear that presentation. Yeah, yeah. I was it's in, such a uh, great presentation. I was just in yeah. London and forgot my uh, power cord, my um, power cord converter, went to Amazon and I see that I need it, I need it in 90 minutes and I got it in 90 minutes. So um, it is the I want it now, yeah. right now movement. Absolutely. So um, that's exciting. It's scary, it's exciting. I think at the same time, I think we are at an inflection point in where we're going to pivot this conversation and talk about Chicago and where Chicago is at. And I think I'll start with um, every single one of you up here as an established uh, 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 business and community member. You've been here a while, right? You have been part of the tech ecosystem. And I think the question I would ask you was we think about what we heard. What do you see, I, I think, is the biggest um, surprising, exciting thing that's happened in the technology environment over the course of the last couple of years? I might flip it then and say, what's the threat? But go either way with that. <clears throat> no, no, start, no, 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 I'm not first. Amanda? Betsy, Probably please. Uh, Amanda. All right, from a Chicago perspective, I'll take kind of a weird angle. I am, nor have I, ne I have never been a CEO of 1871. No. <laughs> I don't know if that undermines You're all credibility, CEO, so we're but I just, here, I I just don't come race. at it from that perspective. I am an operator through and through. I've been at Jelly Vision for 108 years, give or take 90. I've been in the trenches before there was Groupon, before there was 1871, and so I'm going to kind of come at it from an operator's perspective. One of the most interesting things to me happening in Chicago is that tech salaries are rising at an unprecedented clip. And you can think about like, what does that mean? That's not about like tide buttons and stuff, but it's about our ability to attract and retain top talent. One of the big things about Chicago, it has long been a bargain city. We build companies inexpensively, and we're able to create material returns. But I'm just telling you, as we start to finally become competitive, where it's, hey, there is a real offer, young tech talent. You can go share a one bedroom with a roommate on the coast, or stay here and have a two bedroom of your own. And we're not asking you to take a $150,000 pay cut optically to stay here, I think we're going to have more and more innovators and more and more instigators of truly interesting and breakthrough technology. So one thing to watch, it makes it harder to operate, by the way, being in the bargain town, having these salaries raised, but I don't know a CEO who isn't just resetting compensation, not adjusting, but resetting compensation on at least an annual basis. Trend in Chicago. Awesome. Love it. All right, I'll go next. Um, so I come from the venture capital world now, happy to talk about other things like Google in 1871, but there's smarter people than I on those things. With venture capital right now, it's absolutely a trend that's happened in the last two years. We used to wring our hands and be worried about 
um, growth money here. We started to have some angel money, some seed money to get these companies going, but we didn't have that strong B round money, $20, $30 million rounds, those types of funds. What's happened in the last year at least, um, and we've seen it in our portfolio in Chicago, seen it beyond, all the big funds are coming into Chicago companies more than ever before. There is growth capital. They are believing in the companies in Chicago and the Midwest. They understand that we have lower costs of talent generally, um, that it's easy to do business here, that real companies can be built here. This is not like a pipe dream that we had a few years ago. Um, I will give you an anecdote. My partner and I used to go to Silicon Valley and we'd go up and down Sand Hill Road and we'd visit all the major funds. and. We'd show them our deck and say, we're going to invest in a bunch of tech companies in Chicago, and we'd like to serve them up to you at the appropriate time. And they would say, good luck with that. Um, you know, let us know. You know, hopefully that'll work out for you. Um, today, uh, at things like the Chicago Venture Summit that happened last fall, every major firm had a person here. It's not the head people. It's not the, the main partners, but associates, principals are coming out here looking for investment opportunities more than ever before. Um, in our portfolio alone, we saw $400 million in follow-on capital into our companies. We didn't make that happen. They're great companies that just went out and were able to raise that money. So that's a great trend, and I know a big part of the P33 initiative with capital. Yeah, excellent. Yeah. How about you? All right. The thing that I would add is, you know, Chicago does not get the credit I think it deserves, um, you know, certainly across the country. And P33, we'll talk about later, addresses some of that. But if you look at exit values, or the, the total amount of liquidity created by companies in different cities across the country over the last five to six years, Silicon Valley is number one, LA is number two, and Chicago is three. And LA, frankly, is only number two because of SNAP. So they, 30 billion created in LA over the last five years, but 20 billion of that was SNAP. In Chicago, we're at 15. Then it goes New York, Boston, Austin. So New York, uh, Chicago's number three. And when you look at those companies, those are Grubhub, CleverSafe, Field Glass, Groupon. I think the big change that's happened in the last five years versus the, the decade or so before is the founders of those companies have stayed in Chicago and they've built, they're starting to build their next companies. So you've got Chris Gladwin now building Ocean, you've got Eric Lefkowski at Tempest and Brad Keywell at Uptake, and they're creating more and more jobs and creating more and more value in the city. And the other thing that they've done is that they've minted, they've, they've, they've um, equity has, spread throughout their organizations on the companies that have been sold. So they've created people with more wealth that can then invest in new companies and or start their own. And, and that mesh of that network is what we need to truly compete uh, with Silicon Valley and the East Coast. Awesome. I'm gonna f I want to flip to the threat. The what threat? threats? Amanda, I'm looking at you. Oh, I have to go back and flip it. Yeah, yeah. it's got yeah. <laughs> an order now. I, I, uh, I am not Chicken Little. I'm a bullish person. Um, <clears throat> right now, global uh, loans are at 354 percent of the global GDP. That's going to correct. A threat to technology is a threat to everyone. I'm worried about the short-term economy, yep, and that will tighten up big company investment in tech. There are two types of VCs for early-stage companies venture capitalists, and vested customers. And particularly in Chicago, big companies writing pretty big checks to small companies is a great way to seed innovation. And I think if the economy tightens up and, and people start to get skittish, it will have an impact on innovation. It will have an impact on technology. So the economy is a risk. But you would argue that um, if you have funds going into a downturn, I mean, sometimes downturns create a lot of entrepreneurship, right? We're a lot a more people trend. Uh, We raise money in the worst economies ever, and we grow in the worst economies ever, but I wouldn't say that we're a great playbook right. to try to no, follow. No, it's a weird company. For sure, but, but yeah. that could be an opportunity. Right. I would say threat-wise, um, you know, there's a lot of different things. I mean, Chicago's got a challenge still in that we maybe don't think as big as the coast do, and that is an ongoing kind of embracing of risk. I think as we have more success over time with exits and, up and big companies being built here, we will embrace that risk more and maybe take bigger shots. Um, we haven't seen a massive, I mean, I guess you could put Grubhub in a consumer you know, side of things. Um, I would think of that as more B2B to B to C, but um, but you know a company called Cameo that came out of 1871 that we're investors in uh, seems to be one of the you know high flying hot consumer facing apps um, you know here coming out of Chicago and this is a new thing Lightspeed backed them Lightspeed uh, did Snap uh, but they have never invested in Chicago before this company 
Maybe that's true. Maybe we're going to get good at consumer finally, right? Um, so traditionally, we, we, we haven't maybe taken the moonshots as much. We've solved problems in more traditional industries, and that's totally fine. Um, but we potentially need to maybe embrace risk a little bit more out here. I'll go again, and this may not be a popular sentiment, yeah. but as someone who's raised money a couple uh, different times, there is an ethos that you go to the West Coast and they say, what's your technology? You go to the East Coast, they say, what's the size of your market? And you go to the Midwest, and they say, what's your revenue? <laughs> it's really, really hard to build an Instagram when your valuation and how much capital you get is predicated on revenue. Some big ideas take a long time to actually make money. And this is a town that really values, do you have customers? Are you generating revenue? Are we putting accelerant on your path to revenue versus are you changing the world? That's a risk to Chicago. Interesting. So we've talked about this conservative nature of the city, right, mm -hmm. often. Yeah. In defense of the investor side of the house, so on that, I mean, is that it's not just the revenue, it's the indication that the revenue shows product market fit with a customer that they're willing to pay for it. I don't need mass amounts of revenue, but I, I need someone to say, that is so valuable, I'm willing to exchange value for it. I'm willing and to I am rooting for Cameo because it will change my thesis but that they an have Instagram revenue. can't they have start revenue. in Chicago. Conservative Chicago still, yeah. right? So it, it, else? You yeah. can't, we cannot create an Instagram in Chicago. Yeah. Yes, you can. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Eventually. Sorry. The only other thing I would add, I think, is a, is a threat to Chicago, both in tech but more broadly, is that we, we are pretty much a tale of two cities. There's a lot of inequity in the city, and I think that there's the power of technology we can use to actually bridge some of that, and there's talented and aspirational entrepreneurs all across the city, but we haven't yet figured out how to tap into them, and I think it's a huge talent base that we that is at risk. Yeah, awesome. I'm, gonna, I've got a, I've got a, I'm watching them come in here now, so there's one that's very related to something you said earlier, Kevin. Um, great comment on the investor interest in the Midwest. Is this primarily in consumer and or software? Does it extend into hardware and other sectors? <sighs> Sorry, one more time. I, is it just is software? It, is it just hardware yeah. in it's the software. It's, I mean, it, well, all right, so it's, software is what's driving it because it's just easier and cheaper and, and quicker to market and all that stuff. That said, and I don't invest in this a lot, but I spend a lot of time around places like mHub, uh, the hardware side of things should be a huge opportunity for us. Um, we definitely need more capital around that, but um, but 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 we are uh, we are a manufacturing you know capital or, or central place in the in the Midwest of the country. You know you have uh, advanced manufacturing going on here. You have innovation going on. You have makers and tinkers and people building physical devices. But ultimately, we're still in the early days of that, and we have a lot of work to do to really see that opportunity. I think fulfill itself. So and you'd say it's yeah. mostly B2B also. I mean, you, you made the comment earlier as consumer, but if you look at yeah. all the companies at 1871, 70% of them are selling to the business community. Yeah. So I'd love to pivot to P33 just a little bit. So how many in the room have heard of P33 in Chicago or Project 33? Hopefully after tonight, the hands will rise. I, I want to I wanna flip it. We've all been part of this project over the last year, and we're starting to get more and more of the community engaged. And we're at about a, a, a point of a breakthrough actually this week and kind of pivoting to another phase of this work. But I would love to move into that just a little bit and maybe have one of you describe a little bit about what that is, um, what its vision is for those in the, in the room that don't know. Um, and then for me, just there's this curiosity of what, it, what do we all think up here? I know how I feel too about what P33 might do in this, uh, in this uh, sector of getting Chicago to be a technology leader globally. Well, Anybody want to start with that one? You were at the beginning. We all could it. probably, right? Yeah. Again? Wait. Well, you were, well, the, you were in the shoe. Well, so okay, so, over the, here. Yeah. so the two well, of you were in the beginning. That's a great okay. point. Right? Uh, it, to kind of, we're a small room. The polar vortex maybe kept people away and we got rescheduled. Um, it was one of the more interesting rooms I've ever had the chance to walk into, and it was really cool to be sitting at the table, a fly on the wall. It was the CEOs of Chicago's biggest, most successful companies. It was CEOs of some interesting startups. There were investors, there were head of uh, academic institutions sitting around the table with sleeves metaphorically and physically rolled up saying, how do we help each other grow? How do we become a city that can attract talent and retain talent, attract, capital at all stages of business? How do we become an incubator for the next generation of technology? And the interesting thing was it was, it was private sector based. 
Uh, and it, to me, it's like, you know, Chicago is a city that works. It was people working in Chicago saying, how do we better work together to support the ecosystem given how much it's given to us? That's sort of the ethos, is what can we do from financing and marketing and branding and talent and partnerships based on what we already have to start to accelerate and create opportunities for others? Well said. You're so well spoken. Um, I would add to that, um, the, where it came from, the origin of it is so critical um, because, you know, I investors love it. I think everybody up here loves it for various reasons for their what they're doing. But um, it was born really of uh, a guy named Chris Gladwin, and Chris founded a company called CleverSafe that exited a couple years ago for about $1.4 billion to IBM. It was one of our great success stories um, in Chicago in the last few years or ever in tech. And he took it upon himself to want to build, I always thought of it as like a Burnham plan for tech, um, if people know that reference. And um, he really wanted Chicago to stop being kind of in the second tier of tech cities. I mean, we're number one in the second tier probably. Um, you know, we have been traditionally over the last few years, but he really wanted to vault us up to the top with the, with the New Yorks and, and Valleys and all that. Um, but, you know, candidly, Chris is an entrepreneur, tech entrepreneur who he needed some help to do it. I mean, you know, he, could, he wanted, he had this idea, but he needed some partners and he wanted to work with the, the, the broader business leadership in Chicago. So he partnered with the Commercial Club of Chicago, which is the CEOs of all the major corporations, and they helped him build out the plan. Um, Somehow along the way, Penny Pritzker got involved, which was amazing. Penny's just amazing. And uh, since being the director, she, her and Chris got just an amazing partnership. Um, she came back from being Secretary of Commerce and, and, and started working on it. So, um, but to Amanda's point, like this is the first time I've seen the CEOs of major corporations caring about this. And this isn't about the cute little startups you know, that we invest in, that we're hanging out at 1871 or something. This is about the tech community broadly from little startup, which is very important, to growth company that's based here, to big tech that has an office here, like the Salesforces and Facebooks of the world. And then it's about big corporations that need a lot of tech talent. Like down a few floors below us at 1871 is this all-state entity called Arity, which seems that it, like it has three or 400 tech people down there. So the big companies actually I don't think they're in this because they're worried about the entrepreneurs. I think they're in this because they're worried about attracting tech talent over the next couple of decades. To run their businesses. We're all tech companies now. Yeah. So, so you know, I hear a lot of the it was or it is. Or it's, it's going. It is, in my view, this project <laughs> as well. So I love the way that you guys phrase it. These guys were involved from, it was about a, about a year ago that we kicked this thing off, right, from the very beginning as well. But you've then continued over the last couple of months as well. So it's that... What do we think now that this P33 thing is going to do for the city of Chicago? Yeah. And this is all about whether it's a plan, burden plan, yeah. whatever. It's going to be a set of initiatives or whatever, but to get Chicago into that technology leadership position. Yeah. Well, I think at, at, a very, at the very minimum, it's going to give us the top-down narrative of, that, we, that we all can understand about what, what's happening in Chicago. There are so many great things happening in Chicago with respect to tech. I can give you a, a long laundry list now if people are interested, but, but nobody knows it. It's like this. It's like this secret that people in Chicago don't even know. And if you if you go to uh, if I don't know if any of you traveled in Israel, but if you go to Israel and you're in Tel Aviv and you go to any company in Tel Aviv, they first tell the Israel story and then they tell their company story. And for me, aspirationally, I'd love for this to become what is the Chicago story, the the collaborative, public, private. Uh, non-tech and tech company story, and how does your organization fit into that in, in driving forward? And you know, the ultimate goal, of course, in 15 years. So the 33 stands for. Uh, uh, it's a reference back to the last World's Fair that happened in Chicago in 1933, where we were named as the center of technical innovation in the world. And in 15 years, it'll be 2033. And the idea is that this is a a 15-year plan that's going to get us to be a, a uh, ranked as a tech city that is equivalent to our size and scale as a city broadly. And I think, you know, at a minimum, if we get the storytelling right, it'll be a huge, you know, huge uh, tailwind for us. And I think the strength of, of, and you described it well, who's out there and behind this, the CEOs of the, you know, the, of the CEOs of the, of the city and the institu academic institutions, startups, finance, it just goes on and on. So it's a, it's a very powerful thing. Feel free to bring those questions in. I'll pause on P33 here in a second. Unless well, I just another. want to add to Betsy's point, which is probably the most critical thing. I mean, there's all these pieces to it, but the marketing and the messaging and bringing it together and executing on it. Um, you know, and I don't want to get into the political, the, the mayor race, but I just will make the comment that our current mayor 
was the you know one of the best you know promotional folks you could ever have for this. I mean, I got to travel with him, and I think some other people did to Israel and to Boston and New York and San Francisco. And he went around and tried to recruit people through things Chicago and other things. He had a great network. He could call up Elon Musk. He could call up some of these folks and bring them in. Um, you know. And he's been pretty blunt about it. He's like, you guys love to have him around, right? And we did. And, and so we have to, I think, step up as a private sector under the next administration, whoever it is. I'm sure they're all, whoever it is, will be great. But, um, but Ron was special in this way, I think, and we need to appreciate that. Yeah, I was in a Chicago Next, next meeting. You might have been in that meeting, too, where he basically yeah. said, you guys, it's up to you now, right? right? And so I would say the same thing about it to this room as well. It's, it's up to us, right? So. So fantastic. I think one of the, I'm going to flip to some, some fun things here in a second, but one of the other things that we've talked about quite a bit as well is this perception of Chicago as a technology leader. Perception is a reality, right? And I think we talked about this in, in the P33 initiative from the very beginning, maybe even day one a year ago, is um, that question of, wow, I didn't even really stop and take that step back and think about the strengths of Chicago. But that perception is not just a perception issue here in the city of Chicago as well. So it's, you know, maybe the question here is around, you know, perception may be reality, but that perception of Chicago being a technology leader, real or not real? Oh, I, I, we are, we, we, we are in an echo chamber sometimes. We, we, we sit in things like this and we talk about how great we are and all this stuff. And, and like the reality is like, I like going to the coast because we get kind of humbled. It's like, oh yeah, good luck with that. And you know, we don't really think about the Midwest and all that. So I think when you travel around, you realize that you know, we're on the map. People are thinking about us more, but we're not. I mean, like the hot city in the country, the gross city is Austin for sure. I mean, it's, you know, it's not Chicago. Um, yeah, yeah but I, I agree largely, but I think there are facts out there that people don't, act, that are real facts that could stand up against other cities. So we've got the highest percentage of female founders of anywhere in the country by a large margin. We're the second highest producer of software developers. We are the most educated big city in, MBAs, in the country. Right? Yeah. We have the, we have the, you know, um, we're the most diverse economy in the city, in, in the country, right? I mean, there, there are lots of things going for us that we have under leveraged, I think. And maybe under told the story. Oh, for right, sure well. under told the story. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome, yeah, anything else? You want? I just think yeah. if you go to other cities, they don't talk about their cities. <laughs> they, don't, they don't talk about, let's talk about the you know, uh, San Francisco ecosystem, it just doesn't happen. And I think that there is an awful lot of, of hype, and this is a town that values humility, not hype, or helpfulness, mm. not hype. Uh, but if really you go to any of these like startup events on the coast, like everyone is killing everything. And you're like, what does that mean? It sounds so good. Uh, and here it's more, can I help you? Or have you read this book? Or can I connect you with somebody? It's just a lot more humility. And sometimes that can hurt the fact that there are actually companies that are generating real value, that are winning customers, that are building important technology. A lot of our companies tend to be doing important but really boring stuff. like. Like logistics, we are crushing it in logistics right now. We are the hotbed of activity for how yep. stuff is getting around the world. More cool, kick ass companies are coming here, but it's hard to explain to your mom what you do when you work at a logistics company. <laughs> that doesn't mean it's not important, it just doesn't have the sex appeal of the next you know, photo sharing app. Great. Great. Um, awesome. All right, break it up just a little bit. Morning or night person, Kevin? Uh, night, for sure. Night, for sure. Yeah. Both. Oh, stop. <laughs> when do you sleep? Such a <laughs> morning or night person? Very much morning. Wake yeah. up at four yes, every day. Me, yeah. me as well. Very, very productive. Yeah. Okay, so the, the Netflix, Hulu, whatever it is, TV show, anything you're binging, watching now that <laughs> is fun and exciting, if you dare share. Gomorrah season two oh, is out on just, Netflix. If you guys can please read this, the uh, subtitles, it's an unbelievable show. And then waiting for Game of Thrones. Gomorrah's? Yeah. Talk so. about what just happened the other day with you. Oh, I'm in a, a very, very hotly contested Survivor Fantasy League with the founder of Grubhub, <laughs> the creator of Cards Against Humanity, and one of the heads of P33. And we, it's like the only time we talk smack against each other. And I had a chance to meet <laughs> Jeff Probst, so that was really a highlight. <laughs> I don't know if that's helpful to anybody, but it was me having my <laughs> dreams come true. Anything else? No? We don't have to go there. Oh, I just, I, I yeah. woke up early this morning and watched a, a show that my team was talking a lot about, and it's a horrifying show, but it's called Abducted in Plain Sight on Netflix. Of course, the Fire Festival documentaries, have you seen those? Mm. That's like some cautionary tales. 
But abduction plans, plain sight, I would, if you have children, I would encourage you not to don't watch, not it, to watch the, it. the kids. Yeah. Not, not with the kids, like don't watch it at all. I mean, it is horrifying. Yeah, right, right. Yeah. Uh, my wife and I, This Is Us, you know, is good, and True Detective. Uh, has been oh, pretty yeah. good. And then I'm reading the beginning of Bad Blood, which everybody just told me I have to read Bad Blood, yeah. and now I'm reading it, and it's fascinating. So Can Bad Blood think? and Fire Festival uh, documentaries are in the same vein. Yeah, right? that's that's right. there you go. So I still feel like I just go back to Black Mirrors every now and then, but then I have to go and do some sort of detox for myself for a little while. It's <laughs> just a crazy, crazy show. But So thank you for, for going there with yeah. me. Um, uh, you know, a couple of them that are coming in here too, and I'll touch off them. By the way, Amazon's coming up here pretty soon here in a second. But with Chicago becoming an innovation hub, are there examples of legacy businesses being impacted? When you say impacted, what do you mean? You mean that they're being disrupted? I would say we could go either way, right? I would say my, my flip on it would be, well, of course they're being disrupted, but positive, negative. Do you want to start that? Um, sure. I mean, I, I'm not sure I'm going to answer exactly that question, but I'll kind of get Do close to it. Yeah. Okay. So I think you know Howard put the slide up there of if the rate of innovation inside your business isn't faster than that outside your business, you are on a path to you know to a, a dying path, right? And I think there are more and more companies that are starting to pick their head out of the sand, or executive teams pick their head out of the sand, and look around and start to realize that, they, but they're paralyzed, they don't actually know what to do. And when you look at some of the winning business models today, of you know, Airbnb being the largest in its category, not owning any of its own rooms, or Spotify being the largest producer of, of, of content, but not, um, or, uh, you know, not owning any of those assets, not being the creator, or Dropbox being the largest warehouse company in the world, but not owning any, uh, excuse me, storage company in the world, but not owning any of its warehouses, right? The, the, the rate of disruption is incredible, and these companies don't know where to go, how to work with small companies, how to think about it. And, you know, from my perspective, the most successful companies are the ones that have to be the most worried about the future because. Um, they are prey for somebody, right? They are they are on some startups list of, you know, we are going after and, and tackling those. I agree. And I'm start, we're starting at 1871 to see a lot more demand from big companies calling us saying, what you know, what are we supposed to do? How do we how are we supposed to think about this? Paint the context for us. Help us understand where we sit in the world and who might be coming after us and how we can start to position our teams. How we can how we can uh, create the right incentive structure? How can we generate more ideas and act on those things like that? Yeah, excellent. And it's at the risk of sounding like an absolute whiner. It's exhausting. Um, I remember after years and years of being at it, when our our core uh, platform Alex finally got traction, we had this moment of being like, I think we're the market leader in what we do. And the next day, I was sent an email from one of our salespeople where a competitor had come out and they're gunning against us exactly. And we weren't even you know, the size of an Allstate or some giant incumbent. We're just sort of a growth stage tech company. And already two guys in a garage were going for what we had gotten. It's exhausting. Product advantage in this day and age lasts about four months. Four months is about what you get in terms of a leg up for truly innovative breakthrough product. So, so needing to develop customer experiences, being relentless about automating and moving on. I mean, what Howard said, we always talk about it, humans invent, machines automate and scale. And if you're kind of repeating yourself, someone's going to pass you by. So yes, all companies, any established company, I think basically is realizing that four months later, someone's doing what you're doing now. What's new, what's next is the new normal. Yeah. I mean so a couple of different perspectives on that. One, you know, Chicago is a great place for people disrupting kind of old school industries. Um, I look at our company that isn't the most sexy company, but Spot Hero, which disrupted the whole parking world, right? Yep. And, and these were just two scrappy entrepreneurs a few years ago went around to parking garages and said, you know, Hero. can we send people your way for a discount? And, and, and now we're the largest player in the country, but figured it out in Chicago. They nailed the economics. People kept saying, raise money, go to New York, go to San Francisco. And they said, no, we're going to figure it out here for, first and then kind of grow it up. And then we also have Parkways in Chicago, which is another good parking company. So, so we have multiple uh, players in that kind of space. We try and think about um, backing people who have some kind of secret, maybe that sounds kind of cheesy, but that they've been in an industry and they saw some you know, challenge or opportunity that they could go and, and, and 
go after by stepping out and building a company around it. I think about the P44 guys, uh, no relation to P33. <laughs> to, to well back logistics software There was company. no slip there, right? Yeah. <laughs> I know there's a connection right. there somewhere. Um, but Project 44, which I think is a reference, if I'm totally right, I might be making a little of this up, to the project to build the new highway system instead of Route 66. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, a reference to you know the logistics in this country. But P44 has raised $100 million in, in venture money, but this team, we backed them because they came out of the industry, they knew the industry, they knew the players, they knew how things worked, and they were able to, and they saw the opportunity, we were able to, to build and quickly scale a, a solution that uh, has made them a major player in it now. So it's, it, it, you gotta find people, and Chicago's good at that, especially with healthcare or FinTech, where we can find people who know the industries they're disrupting. We'll never back someone who has to kind of learn on our dime and figure out the industry and then maybe come to something. But back to your risk aversion points earlier, you know, it's taken a longer time, I think, for the big Fortune 500 companies in, in our neighborhoods, in, our, in, in the Midwest, to sort of come to grips with it. And one of the things I, I said to a company the other day was the seven, seven words of a, of a dying or a dead organization is we've never done it that way before, mm -hmm. right? And, I, and you, I just see so much of, so much of that. Right? That's right. That's, That's right. excellent. So, so Amazon. So, I mean, I think for, for me, and I think we, we, back to the perception and the tooting our horn about the strengths that we have as well, and we, you rattled off several of them. There's so, so many. And you guys know, many of you in the room know many of them. I mean, we're starting to put together fact packs actually under the P33 umbrella to start to talk about those, those strengths. And number one, corporate relocation for five years, the city of Chicago, right? So, so in, incredible, and that's World Business Chicago and, and a number of other, other groups as well. But if I, um, let's do the Amazon, because that's come up here a couple of times as well, right? And you know, one of them is, you know, should, we, you know, should, should we go after Amazon still? But the question might also be for me as well, um, it, was it a loss? Was it a major loss? And, and you know, and or what's the opportunity for us in all of that? I, I don't have, I, don't, I can't speak to really what would happen, but I do know that when HQ2 went on, I called my board and said, expect our salaries to reset by about 17% within a year, because it's just gonna be a crazy land grab. But I think that there are lessons that everything that went into the stimulus package in terms of promises to make Chicago great for Amazon will make Chicago great for everybody. Investment in our schools, investment in public transportation, all those kinds of things, like we should figure out how collectively people here and growing here can work together on those things because what, what makes a great city for Amazon to compete and win, in fact, is probably great for everyone in every sector of industry, period. Period. Love period. It. Um, you know, I was one of the few, I feel like, who was like, I think we can get it. Why didn't we get it? I feel like, you know, people kind of turned at it right away. I was like, no way we're getting it, right? Um, and, you know, I was on the 600 person committee. It was a very small committee uh, that tried to get them here. I did very little and know nothing about what actually went into it except what the finished result, which was that's the value of it, right? Like, yeah, we didn't get it. Maybe it would have been great. Maybe it wouldn't have been great. We're still getting a few, I don't know how many thousand jobs Amazon has promised here, but there's Amazon people all over the city. So it's not like we didn't get anything, right? Um, and, and what's been going on in the East Coast is it shows that maybe the process wasn't the right process, but the reality is we have all these marketing materials now that we can just repurpose for right. Salesforce or for Facebook or for XYZ hot company um, that, that grows up. So, so I, I think it was a good use of time and resources to the marketing question. I mean, honestly, that's the best marketing we've ever done of this city. Um, and it, and it brought just, these. It connected the dots across all these different. Yes, you know, when totally. I was at Northwestern when it, when Public the bid was being put together. together, and everybody came together to tell the story. Hmm. And put our best foot forward. We it would have been a disaster, Tracy, not to you know not to say you know we're right? good, we're good, we're not going to bid. I mean, you had to you had to try. Awesome. And we did. So I've lost the questions, Brad. If you're out there, maybe you can pull this back up for me. We'll come back to this in a second. But you know, the other one that I want to go down is we've talked a lot about inclusivity in this city. Uh, we've talked about the importance of, and I just remember sitting in the room with Mary Dillon and a number of other folks, and if we would have a meeting where we didn't bring back up, thank you very much, uh, inclusion and diversity or something, it would be at least Mary or some others that would say, Mary Dillon uh, of Alta, you know, where are you guys at in thinking about inclusivity as it is a factor in building technology leadership in, the, in the, the city of Chicago. So I'd love to touch on that because I know for a fact, knowing the three of you, mm -hmm. 
inclusion and diversity is incredibly important to each of you. So it's almost like, what are those things that we need to get right to set the city apart, to be a technology leader? What are those things that we need to do? You want to? Oh, go ahead. Betsy. Sorry. Betsy. Well, I think that, I think you have to look at it a couple of different ways. I think you know I mentioned the fact a, a minute ago about the percentage of female founders yeah. in Chicago, which is a tremendous fact. I don't really know why that is. I don't know. Understand that I have some hypotheses, but how do we continue to to build on that and you know attract more and more women? And there's a handful of things that we need to do to support them better than we do today. Capital being chief among them, and we can dig into that more if, if people are interested. I think the second second or third thing is. We've got to figure out how to engage uh, those people across the 77 neighborhoods in the in the city. Um, and when I think about entrepreneurship, it doesn't always have to be tech entrepreneurship. And when you look at what's happening in, in the country, about two years ago, uh, we started to, more businesses died every month than were born, which was the first time in like a 40-year history that that had happened. And when your, you know, most of job creation comes from small businesses. And when the small business engine is dying, the job creation engine is dying, which puts more and more pressure on our city. So how do we, how do we truly reach those people across the city that, and equip them with what they need to get a, a business yes. going? And then the third thing I would just say is that one of the efforts that we've put forward at 1871, we're partnered with YWCA, Metropolitan Chicago, and everyone in our space has to take training on how do you develop a safe and healthy workplace. And so whether you are a founder of an idea and you don't have anyone else on your team, or you're a three-person team, you're getting the tools, resources, training framework to, to build a company that, has, that is steeped in the right principles on how you lead people and, and, on, and, on, and on inclusivity. So, and the hope is that when they leave 1871 and they get bigger, they remember those things and so they grow in very, very positive ways. So one of the questions that just came in, and I think you really touched on it as well, and we're, I know we're talking a lot about P33, but it is a foundation to a lot of the things that we're talking about in the, in the city of Chicago, but does T, P33 have a social betterment component to it that will work with underprivileged areas of the people of Chicago? So you, I know you were touching on some of those things, but the answer to that, that question is yes. So when I use the word inclusion and, and diversity, it isn't about you know female, or it isn't gender, it isn't any of those, it's, it's, it's everything. And you talked about south of, right? And, and we brought into the project as well a number of initiatives that are going on in all areas of the city, and the conversations are, do you double down on X, Y, Z? Um, so you know, I'm going to quickly answer it with a yes, but I don't know if you want to add just anything more. To that point, um, sorry. Okay. Um, to that point, though, uh, so uh, Chicago needs to do better. Everybody needs to do better. Um, but we, I think, and I might have alluded to this last year, so apologies if I'm repeating. We have an opportunity because we're a more nascent ecosystem right. than, not to pick on the valley, but the valley 100%. that's just generationally challenged here, and they they're not going to program their way out of this. They've got to really make some wholesale changes and we'll let them deal with that. Chicago generally is a more inclusive. The data shows that we're more inclusive. We still have a long way to go, but we're a more inclusive community. Um, that we're more welcoming generally. I think we could be a magnet for people from other parts of the country who maybe don't feel welcome in other communities could come here, right? And this could be a better place for women to build their businesses or for Hispanic Excellent. entrepreneurs to build their businesses or African American, you know, I, I, I think we could do that. I mean, that would take marketing and messaging and effort directly around that. Um, I will say the venture community launched something in the last year, which I promised a member of my team at TV that uh, I, would, I, would, I would plug this, but it's called Chicago Blend, chicagoblend.org, and it's the VC community in Chicago, which is very small, but us really look at taking a hard look at you know, our diversity you know, numbers, how we are doing as a community, and how our portfolio companies are doing, and then trying to be intentional about how to uh, start addressing this. I mean, you know, workshops around with our portfolio companies around diversity hiring. You know, like little things like that maybe, but we think over long term that it'll make a big impact. But and you um, guys were just named number one, right, in the whole country. Well, yeah. Right. Yeah. Awesome. Right. That's well, cool. Good. Yeah. Say, no, no, no. Yeah. That's good. Tell people. I, I'll sort of take. This is a topic near and dear to everybody. Three things. One, we need to change who has big exits. The second, women start putting up big numbers. A lot of the narrative dies. I'm trying. Other women are trying. But it really is about getting the big exits, the IPO. The more females lead shareholder value, a lot of the narrative will change. 
Secondly, in the early stage perspective, we change who writes checks, we change who gets checks, so we change who has a chance to grow faster. And it is very important that people of means can write checks to early stage companies and start to seed companies that might not get funding through traditional means. I once heard that if you're a woman in tech and you make six figures, you should be writing at least one angel check a year. It's part of like giving back. Hopefully it's a good investment. You know, high risk asset class, but it's a way to give back. So I invest through Hyde Park Angels, but really, truly change who writes checks and you will change who has a chance to grow. And then the final thing, there's a huge, huge effort by a lot of great companies, I'll name two, Code Nation, and code now, and what they're trying to do is normalize tech as a career for underrepresented kids in Chicago inner city schools. And what they do is they teach technology, they bring you into software companies, they give you a look of what this career is for young people who may not need to finish school to have an amazing career, and these are both worth investing in and giving them financing so they can sort of teach coding to people who may not be getting even the basics in, of high school, and they can still walk out of high school and get a job making $90,000 a year at a great tech company if they can learn how to code. Um, so three buckets there. Awesome. Okay, so we still have a few questions coming in here too, but just as a reminder, the 22333 exec, text exec 22333. All right, some fun. Favorite emoji or the emoji that you use the most on your cell phone or wherever? I have a Bitmoji that I use. For oh, do you? Yeah, so, yeah. Sad. so my nephews just taught me yeah. about that. Yeah. 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 So depending on what's happening during the day, it's a different You've got a costume or yeah. hair or face or whatever, right? Yeah. Yeah. Three to one. I have a smiley so face for, for me. Yeah. Um, favorite but what does the smiley face mean? Like, thumbs up is like, yeah, good. Oh, got well, it. For sure. Got it. Yeah, I got it. Yeah, smiley face is I'm happy. I'm happy. Okay, so favorite breakfast food? Or breakfast at all? Coffee. Uh, honey Nut Cheerios. Awesome. Yeah. It's just. <laughs> that cinnamon like, toast crunch. Not <laughs> and coffee. Uh, scrambled eggs. Scrambled eggs. Good eggs. Protein for me as well. Um, okay, so let's go to privacy. So, what is your perspective as we go back to technology, data, et cetera? Your perspective on big tech's role in consumer privacy? I, I'm wrong, so I can talk about what I thought was gonna happen. I thought that when Cambridge Analytica happened, I was really excited for my business, with ultimately deals in healthcare, because I thought the government was gonna get involved, write rules that we can all follow, and it would lead to an absolute revolution in modern APIs around healthcare. And I thought the better data we have about each user, the better we're gonna be able to guide them to the right care, to the, the cost uh, savings vehicles and things like that. It, in fact, it didn't happen. I said, we're two years away from like really codifying rules and, 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 and universal standards. What became clear is that our government doesn't understand privacy at all, so add probably five to seven years on top of that. I think public uh, companies, leading tech companies, need to sit down and as best as possible help educate our government, but I think our government is gonna be driving standards, not the private sector. That's my, my guess. Right, and I have no editorial about whether that's right or wrong. I'm not informed enough to know if it's right or wrong, but I suspect our government will be better at protecting users than private companies. And, and do you think that's because the private companies don't feel like they actually have to change? I mean, we, there's lots of examples right now of major public companies that are violating privacy left and right, and they're, regardless of the pressure they're getting, they're not making any substantial changes. Yeah, the private sector is not gonna they're not going to rein in themselves. We need, we need, there needs to be something outside of that. I will remember back because I'm old and I'm 45, but I'm old enough to remember the dot-com boom for those of you millennials in here. Um, and I remember in 2000, a company called DoubleClick that was public, it was a 900-pound gorilla in the ads of the world, got dragged up on Capitol Hill because they were targeting ads to people's personal information. How dare you? I can't believe you do that. And, uh, you know, a few years later, it was totally commonplace. Today, we give up all kinds of data, don't seem to care. Um, you know, having been at Google, I saw over time that people are willing to give up a lot in exchange for, uh, you know, value. They're, you know, they can always take their data away. Um, Brian Fitz in Chicago actually led that initiative. You can pull your data out of Google anytime you want, put it in a suitcase and run off with it. But the reality is people, you know, if there's value exchange, they're willing to give up, especially I think younger folks are willing to give up that data. So, um, I, you know. 
just just I think, think about what's happening. There was, a, there was a big article today about the people who uh, screen content for Facebook. Has anyone heard about this? The people, they have PTSD from, because basically there are tens of thousands of $11 an hour workers who have to watch the worst of the worst of the internet. And Facebook stock did not take a hit. There's no incentive. Yeah. What is gonna drive change is that YouTube is losing advertisers because children, you know, good pro uh, providers can't make sure that everything beside their ads is safe content. So it's starting to cost Google money. That is gonna drive the change. Right now, if Google uh, breaches your privacy, the EU will come and find them a whole $10 million. It's, yes. it's like nothing to them. It's nothing. There's no punishment at all. It's got to be advertisers voting with their dollars, users voting with their feet, and the government having real sticks involved with compliance. Otherwise, it's like it's a blip, move on, new yeah. news day. Well, when we have 130 million U.S. households with Alexa in, in them, listening to everything that yeah. is happening in our households, right? It, it's, it's an extrapolation of what you just talked about. I just wonder why that ring is always rotating for me. I don't know. What is she, <laughs> what is she listening to? <laughs> Plug, unplug her. All righty. So I'm going to wrap up. I'm going to get us here to the last question. So I think, um, you know, Howard talked about, wow, did I write this down as well? Voice, 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 right? Voice as we think about the future and, and you know, voice is everything here, right? In, in his perspective as well. What's your prediction for the future? <laughs> Technology, not anything else. You got the crystal ball here, right, as well. I mean, why get you excited about it? Hey, let's go. No, yeah. you're oh, my. What? <laughs> One of my. Um, I like it when we ask, you know, what's in it for the user, not voice mm -hmm. or AI, because what I used to be gamification or personalization, like the, the, the tactics change, but like fundamentally what people, what do people want? Yeah. Yeah. Convenience, those things are interesting Human. to me. I, uh, <laughs> but I think, I think more and more robots will be doing things that people used to do, and that is both scary and amazing. There you go, all right. Um, I am fascinated by, uh, I was saying this earlier to Betsy, um, I'm the board of the North Shore Health System, hospital system, we're doing a partnership with Color, which is a well-funded valet company that, um, you know, they take your blood and they, they figure out any, you know, anything you could potentially have, any sickness you could have in the future, what you're more prone to, what you're not prone to, what kind of wine you, you're prone to like. I mean, it just can figure out everything about you. And some people don't want to know all that. They don't want to know that they have a chance to potentially, you know, they have the gene for Parkinson's or something like that, which I totally get. So I think that's fascinating to think about, like, how much information do you want to know yeah. um, about yourself? And then, and then the, the privacy debate about that, making sure that that data never gets out. But could you couple it with your children's, your parents, and, and have a family kind of, yeah. you know, dossier or Every something? Every time I get it. one of those emails from 23andMe and it says there's a new report out there, I'm like, ah, oh, do I open right, it? I don't know, right? Right, right, right. Yeah. So yeah. I'll, I'll make predictions that in 50 years, you can call me on this, not only will we have autonomous vehicles, we will have a cashless society. Mm -hmm and humanless operating 50? rooms. 50? Did you say 50? 50 years. 50? Huh. All right, I'll, I'll throw yeah. out two things. The first is, you know, if, if you look at the world population today, we have about 7.5 billion people on the planet, and about 4 billion people have access to the internet. Within five years, we should have 8 billion people yeah. on the planet, and all 8 billion are likely to have access to the internet. So it's almost 4 billion more customers uh, out there. And so how, what is that going to do in terms of who gets access to education? What are they going to need in terms of access to services, health care, uh, you know, um, infrastructure, and, and the, the customer pool that, that all the other companies have now have access to? So I think that's going to be massive. Nobody seems to be talking about it. I think it's going to be really, really important. So that's number one. And number two, I'll give a, an eSports uh, um, prediction, which is eSports right now is about a $900 million uh, sector of business um, industry. In a couple years, it'll be close to $2 billion. And I think the question with eSports is who is the athlete? Mm. And I think it's, it's going to be the machine, it's the machine yeah. learning experts, right? It's those guys are the pe go guys, people, women and men, who are the athletes. And I, I just was reading the other day that there's a talent agency being formed focused like a, a sports agency focused on machine learning experts. Um, oh, that's, yeah, so that's coming fast. So we'll check back. I don't know if it's going to be 50 years, but we'll see. But we'll check back in here in a few years and see where we're at. <laughs> I think it'll be less yeah. than 50. Yeah, I think it'll be right? less than 50. Yeah. So it is and always good 
to be in the same room with, with you guys and with everyone out here as well. I want to just thank you, um, myself. Uh, thank you for taking the time today. And I think we are we are at the end here. I'm going to uh, bring up Joe. Joe, yeah, one of us. Is yeah. that right? Yeah, yeah. from Discover. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So close us out here. Do we you go. There we go. Thank you. There we go. All right, that was pretty good pronunciation. Thanks, Tracy. Um, my name is Joe Boniface. I am a Vice President of Application Development at Discover Financial Services. And I gotta say that I'm very proud, thanks to this panelist, to be from Chicago and to be a Chicago company. You guys did great, and I really uh, kind of feel that energy. So um, thanks, thanks again for that panel. I want you guys to all join me in another round of applause. So this is the first time I've been ever asked to close off a panel, and I gotta say that it keeps you quite focused when uh, you wanna pick up on what they're all saying and be able to uh, really kind of recap it. So, uh, you know, first we had Howard really talking about the power of voice. We heard it referenced up here, and I, you know, my takeaway from that is really, you know, you get down to that zero position, right? That zero position is gonna be so important going forward. We communicate on the mobile device, and, and I think you really brought that home, really talking about how voice is going to be um, key to that conversational web and how point zero is important. And my big takeaway from the panel is really your P33 comment. I had not heard about Project 33 uh, you know, previously, and I gotta say that I'm quite energized and I'm gonna try to figure out how I can personally be part of this because you really, I think, have uh, come up with a great formula to really raise uh, Chicago's presence. We have all the ingredients, it's just a matter now of, of pulling them together. So I think that alone was really worth the, um, you know, the panel, but the, I thought this was an absolutely terrific uh, presentation today. I want you guys to um, all be aware that this is just one of uh, several upcoming Executive Club's programming events, and you can go to the website uh, executiveclub.org for all the information on the upcoming events. Once again, we hope you enjoyed tonight's presentation, gained some useful knowledge about what's happening around the Chicago tech community, and have a wonderful evening, and let's just finish off with a great round of applause.